So we're going to continue today with our discussion on filters and oh, I think I have to do a thing from my end. So did everybody get a chance to look at this uh, spreadsheet over the weekend? This one? No? Come on. It's coming. It's coming. It did the little thing on my end. Hey! All right. Never ceases to amaze me when it works. Okay. So, um, so if memory serves me correctly, uh, we made this uh, this filter, and um, you know it's pretty cool, right? So let me just uh, summarize the steps. What we did. Uh, the first thing we did was we looked at the RC circuit, and we we thought about it in terms of. Um, uh, phasor impedances. Once we thought about it in terms of phasor impedances, it was easy to predict the output. Like we knew the output was going to be a cosine. All we had to figure out was that what the amplitude and phase was of the output cosine. And we decided that once we phasor, once we make our, our impedances into phasors, then we can just apply the voltage divider rule to get the transfer function. And that's exactly what we did. So we applied the um, the voltage divider rule, and that was a big success. And then we had an equation for the magnitude of the, um, of the, of the expected output, and that's all we were plotting here. So I made um, RC. I made one column with some frequencies in it. I made, uh, and then over here in this column, um, we applied the magnitude formula that we had calculated for our RC circuit, which was 1 over the square root of 1 plus the quantity omega rc squared. And that's what you're looking at in this column, is you're looking at the output amplitude uh, relative to the input frequency. And what we see is that at very, high, uh, very low frequencies, sorry, at very low frequencies, your output uh, magnitude is 1. That means whatever your input size is, your output is, is that same size. So if your input was a cosine with amplitude 1, your output is a cosine with amplitude 1. If your input was a cosine with amplitude 7, your output is 1 times that 7. So you, you get 7 out, all right? So, and then as the frequency gets bigger, the output gets smaller and smaller and smaller. All right, finally, in order to get the plot that you're looking at on the right, uh, we applied this, uh, we did two tricks, not one, we did two tricks. Uh, the first trick that we did was that we, instead of plotting our straight amplitude, K, we converted it into decibels. And in order to convert it into decibels, we took the value of k, and um, we took the value of k, and we did 20 times log base 10 of that number. So log base 10 of 1 is 0. 20 times 0 is 0. So the way we interpret that is that 0 dB always corresponds to a gain of 1. 0 dB means there's 0 change. Output equals input. If you're Gain has a negative decibels. Negative is smaller. So you think of it as your output is smaller than your input. If you have positive gain, right, if you come up with like 10 dB or 20 dB or 50 dB, a positive, a positive dB means a positive change. That means your output is bigger than your input. We're not dealing with that in this circuit. Okay. Uh, so that was the first trick we did was to go with decibels. And then the second trick we did was to use a logarithmic axis uh, on our x-axis. And that's how we arrived at this pretty standard plot that you're, uh, that you're looking at over here. What do you think? So that's Monday, that, was, uh, that was Friday's lecture in four minutes. Good. That's not bad. So um, what we're going to discuss today is... Um, the cutoff frequency. Do we, do we change the values of R and C? I can't remember. Do we, do we play that game? Yeah. Cool. All right. So, um, so it's, it's a low-pass filter, but then there is still this concept of, does this filter have a cutoff frequency? Okay. So, so today I want to explore this concept of a cutoff frequency. So what the cutoff frequency is, it's, I mean, clearly what's happening here is that we've got some frequencies are being passed, some frequencies are being rejected, 
And uh, there's a cutoff frequency. I don't know. If you just had to eyeball this, what would you say the cutoff frequency is? I mean, within a factor of 10 would be great. What frequencies look like they're being passed? Is uh, 0.001 radians per second being passed? Yeah, how about 0.01? 0.1? Is 0.1 radians per second getting passed? Yeah. Yeah, how about 1? Yeah, how about 10? Mm, yeah, 10 is like kind of on the edge, right? Definitely once you get to 100, woo, not so much. Let's see. 10 radians per second. Wow, look at that. 10 radians per second, your signal is 0.44. That means if you put in a cosine with amplitude 1, it's coming out with amplitude 0.44. That's definitely getting rejected. Um, I said, what about 1? You said definitely 1. Yeah, 1. If you put in a cosine with a frequency 1 radians per second, it's coming out 98% the original size. That's basically getting, getting passed. So just by eyeballing it, I would say that the cutoff frequency is bigger than 1, but less than 10. Right? It's somewhere in the middle there. So I want to know, know a couple things. First of all, I want a definition. Right? How do we define... How do we define a cutoff frequency? Right? Because, you know, it certainly can't be defined as eyeball the graph, right? That ain't, that's, that's not going to fly. Um, so, and then once we have a definition, we want to say, like, can we, can we custom make a filter, right? Can we do a custom design? Right? Because what I want to do, I want to be able to say, make me a low-pass filter that passes everything below 10 hertz and rejects everything above 10 hertz, okay? Or I want to say, make me a low-pass filter that, that passes everything below 10,000 hertz and rejects everything above 10,000 hertz, right? That's a very different filter. They're both low-pass filters. They just have different cutoff frequencies. So we need to understand how that works. And then we're good to go. That's it. Then you understand all filters. Seriously. Like, if you can understand the math that we're doing here, if you can, because all we had to do to get this to work was to start by understanding how impedances work, right? The, the phasor impedances. If you understand that, and you understand how to build, um, you know, how we, from, we got from there, we used the voltage divider, we got this formula. It's all just, it's all math at that point. But like conceptually, I can give you a, a, a substantially more sophisticated system, and you would know exactly what, what to do. All right, should we keep going? Okay. Oh, and um, to guide us, let me just do this thing that we did on uh, Friday again. Let me just sort of monkey around with some of these frequencies. So I'm going to go from a resistor of 1,000 to a resistor of 2,000. What happened to my cutoff frequency? Let's go from 2,000 to 4,000. Is my cutoff frequency getting bigger or smaller? Good. So it seems that as my resistor goes up, my omega sub c, my cutoff frequency, goes down. And vice versa. If I make r smaller, my cutoff frequency gets bigger. So one way or another, that's, that's the property that, that we're trying to hit. Okay? Whatever we discover is going to tell us that. What about if I mess with my capacitance? And if I go back to my original value, what if I make my capacitor, uh, what if I make my capacitor bigger? So here I'm doubling my capacitor. Doubling it again. And again. Oops, that's not a doubling. Okay, every time I double it, is my cutoff frequency getting bigger or smaller? Smaller. So increasing either resistor or capacitor makes my cutoff frequency smaller. OK? All right. So um, let me just mute this for a minute. Wow. OK. Um, so let me just bore you for a minute with some math. Um, let me just beat. Was that mine? Okay. 
Um, so by definition, the cutoff frequency is defined as that frequency which makes the magnitude of the transfer function um, equals root 2 over 2. Okay, root 2 over 2 is about 0 0.707. And it has a very important property that, and so why? Like, okay, why, who thought up 0.707? I mean, what, what kind of nonsense is that, right? So it turns out that if you take a cosine, so let's say this is your original cosine with amplitude uh, plus or minus 1. So let's say you measure the power in that cosine. Do you remember, do you, does everybody know how to measure power in a cosine? Average power over one period? Seriously? What do they teach you in circuits one? Don't answer that. I'm wearing a mic. Um, okay, let's take this aside. So we're taking an aside from our aside. Um, so we'll have to pop our way back into action in a few minutes' time. Okay, so for a cosine, or for any periodic signal, for any periodic signal, average power is defined as 1 over the period times the integral over 1 period of your signal squared. That's how you define any periodic signal. If I say, what's the average power? You just stick it in here. Take your signal, you square it, you integrate that squared signal over one period, and you divide by the width of the period. You just divide by the period. That gives you the average power over one period. Okay? So, um, for a cosine, so we actually do this, Blech. Let me think through it if I can remember whether or not this is an ugly integral or not. It's not pretty. Um, actually, we don't have to do it. Okay. So um, let's just at least set it up. So let's say we have um, let's say we have cosine of omega t, and I want to find its average power. So first thing I need to know is the period. So how do I know the period? If my frequency is omega, what's my period in terms of omega? 2 pi over... I have to see if I can remember. Okay, so we know that omega equals 2 pi f, and f is equal to 1 over t. So t has to equal... 2 pi over omega. Good. So if I were to get the average power of my cosine, it would be 1 over t times the integral from 0 to 2 pi over omega of cosine omega t squared. Okay? And presumably, you could use a table of integrals, or God forbid you punch it into Wolfram Alpha or something, and, or your calculator, or whatever. You can get a number, okay? I don't really care what the number is. But we agree we can get a number. Deal? Good. Now, all of this is for a cosine whose magnitude is 1, right? Now, I've just said we define the cutoff frequency as the frequency that gives you a cosine who is 0 0.707. And I said, what's the deal with, like, why is 0 0.707 special? So let's take that same cosine, be root 2 over 2, 0 0.707 cosine t, uh, omega t. So this was my original cosine. Now I'm saying let's take the power of this slightly smaller cosine. Where's that? 
It's 1 over t. So if that's okay, t, right. it's 1 over it. Good. So let's take the power of not my original cosine, which is just 1 times cosine omega t, but now 0 0.707 times cosine omega t. OK. So what's my t? What's my period? My, have I changed my period? <clears throat> have I changed my frequency? No. no. So my period's the same. OK. So it's still omega over 2 pi, integral over 1 period, 0, 2 pi over omega. Now here's where I've got to be careful. I've got to take my signal and square it. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So here's my signal. I'm going to square it. So what do I get if I square root 2 over 2? Right, I get 2 over 4. It's a half, right? It's a half. Don't tell me otherwise. It's a half. Cosine squared omega t. Hey, what can I do with that 1 half? Pull it out of the integral. So what am I left with? 1 half times 1 half times omega over 2 pi, integral over 1 period, cosine squared omega t. So it's half of the original power. OK? If your original signal was cosine omega t, so I, just to refresh, just to put the pieces back together. We started with the problem. We need to define cutoff frequency. I said, we have a definition. The cutoff frequency is the one that makes the size of your cosine. Remember, at low, at low frequencies, cosine size was 1. And then as frequency got bigger and bigger, the size of the cosine got smaller and smaller. I said, we're going to define the cutoff frequency as that frequency that corresponds to where the size is 0 0.707. Not quite all the way at 1 and not quite all the way at 0. Not 0 0.707. What's special about 0 0.707? It turns out that when your signal is down to 0 0.707, that's the, that's, that is where the signal has half as much power as it had originally. Okay? That means that although you've only reduced its amplitude from 1 to 0 0.707, you've actually reduced its power by half. So this is the half power point. That's where it comes from. It's not arbitrary. Okay? So if you put in a signal, a cosine, which goes from minus 1 to 1, and what you get out is a signal that goes from minus 0 0.707 to plus 0 0.707, then whatever power this signal had, this signal has half the power. Okay? So this signal has half power, and this has all the power, OK? So whatever this power is, that's half of it. So that's where it comes from. It's not arbitrary, OK? So we, I don't know, at some point, a bunch of engineers sat down, and they said, we'll pick the half power point. We'll define that as the cutoff frequency. Sound good? All right. So if I've confused you, don't worry about it, OK? All we need to do is find the frequency that gives us a magnitude of 0.707, OK? Um, let's see if we have such a frequency. Let me just have a quick look. Let me just turn this on for just a second. Nope. OK, so just for a second. Is there a frequency? Is there a frequency on our table that gives us an output uh, that is 0 0.707 as big as the input? Five. It's right here. You see that? At five radians per second, my output amplitude is 0 0.707 of the input amplitude. Okay, and that happens to correspond to minus 3 decibels. 
Okay. Oh, we got all sorts of useful nonsense to write down now. Okay. So, so the half PowerPoint, so we can define this. There's basically like three equivalent, three equivalent ways to describe what our cutoff frequency is. It is the half power point. It is the frequency where your output is 0 0.707 of the input. And it's also the frequency where your output is at minus 3 decibels. Okay? Because if you take 20 log 10 of 0 0.707, right? If you take the decibels you get negative 3 dB. So sometimes we call our cutoff frequency the 3 dB point. Yes? That's like the average power over there. Yes, it does. Average mm -hmm. power over one period. All right. What is the cutoff frequency of this circuit? All right. Let's actually see if we can figure out what it is. So what was our transfer function? Does anybody remember? You're not going to make me derive it again, are you? One over. What's that? One plus. Right. One over g omega rc. That was like the full transfer function in phasor, you know, in complex form. And then we took the magnitude of it, because remember, this contains both magnitude and phase. We took the magnitude of it, and we said, all right, the magnitude equals one over the square root of 1 plus omega rc squared. So, and right now in the particular calculation that we're doing, we have r equals, I think, 1,000, and c equals, what do we have, 200 microfarads. So, can we solve for the cutoff frequency of this circuit? We already know the answer, right? Excel told us the answer. We already know the answer is, what was it, 5? Five? 5 radians per second? Let's prove it. So, I want to know, the question I want to know is, what value of omega gives... H equals 0.707. That's it. If I know what frequency of omega gives me 0.707, that is, by definition, my cutoff frequency. So let's try it. OK, so. I want my magnitude of H to be 0 0.707. And I know from my formula that we calculated from our, our, our phasor um, voltage divider that that is going to equal 1 over the square root of 1 plus omega RC squared. I'm going to leave omega rc as variables now. We'll come back later at the end and sub in, sub in values. So my whole goal now, I want to ask what value of omega. So I, all I want to do is take this equation and solve it for omega, right? Because that will tell me what value of omega gives me the half power point. Okay, so what's my first move? Square both sides, right? Let's get rid of those radicals. So root 2 over 2, if I square it, becomes 1 half. I feel like we've done that before today. That's good. And on the, the other side, 1 over 1 plus omega rc squared. That's good. It's looking a little tidier. Now what? Cross multiply. OK. So if I do that, I'm going to get 1 plus omega rc squared times 1 equals 2. Oh, it's 
gets better and better, right? Who could believe our luck? What's my next step? Subtract a 1 from both sides. What's my next step? This gets better and better, right? If I take the square root of both sides, what happens to my omega RC squared? If I take the square root of that? Omega RC, you're welcome. What happens when I take the square root of 1? OK, we're almost there. What's our cutoff frequency? 1 over RC. Hey, if R is 1,000 and C is 200 microfarads, what is 1 over RC? All right, let's have a look. 1 over 1,000 times 200 micros. So let's see, 1,000 times a micro is a milli. That's 200 milli. That's 0.2. 1 over 0.2, you're not going to believe this. 5 radians per second. Have a nice day. Okay, let's test this. Does this have the properties that we expect? All the way over on the left-hand board, we stipulated that if either my resistor or my capacitor went up, my cutoff frequency went down. Does this equation predict that? Yes. Okay. In fact, it doesn't even matter whether it's the resistor or the capacitor. They both weigh equally, right? So. If you know the resistor or the capacitor, uh, sorry, if you increase resistor or capacitor, cutoff frequency goes down, and vice versa. And for this circuit, RC had a special name, right? Tau, that was the time constant. So really, for this circuit, it just so happens that your cutoff frequency is the reciprocal of the time constant, which is cool, because I told you, and you believed me, that, remember we did step responses? I said, for a first order circuit, all you need to know is the time constant. Right? Once you know the time constant, you know everything. That's the only variable there is for a first order circuit. Okay? And that was cool. And once again, we're seeing the same thing here. If you know the time constant, you know everything. You know the cutoff frequency of the circuit. That's the only thing you need to know. Okay? That's the only relevant the only relevant piece of information for a first order circuit. If you know the time constant, you've got everything. Wow. That's a lot of pieces together. OK, so here's what we're going to do. Now we're going to design a circuit. Let's put the lights on, wake some of you up. There's only so much yelling I can do, so we'll have to depend on the lights for the rest of my needs to wake you up. So what if we come along and say, design a low-pass filter. Now watch, I'm going to be sneaky. With a cutoff frequency of 20 kilohertz. 20 is a common number, right? 20. Um, 20 is useful because it's uh, the limit of human hearing. So audio signals typically are, are they extend up to 20 kilohertz, right? Because that's, you can't hear past 20, so no point recording them and putting them on your iPod. Heck, your iPod can't even play 20 kilohertz, so it's definitely not worth deleting them. It's definitely not worth keeping them, rather. Okay, so let's... Let's see, can we design ourselves? So I need a value of R and C, basically, that will give me a low-pass filter with a cutoff frequency that I desire. So what's my first step? OK. Well, what do we know? What, is the, what do we say the definition was? Omega cutoff equals 1 over RC. OK. Now what? Ah, so this kills undergrads at every university every year. Okay, getting omega and frequency, uh, getting omega and and hertz mixed up. 
Okay? If you ever go to lab and you have to like design a circuit with a certain cutoff frequency and you get in there and your cutoff frequency is off by a mysterious factor of six, okay? Six is equal to about two pi. Okay? Well, for what it probably suggests is that you calculated a cutoff frequency in radians per second, but you're in the lab measuring cutoff frequency in hertz, and you're off by a factor of two pi, factor of six. So you gotta, you gotta mind your two pi's. So I told you I want a cutoff frequency of 20 kilohertz. What that really means is that you want a cutoff frequency of 2 pi times 20k. So that's going to be 40 pi k rads per second. And that is going to equal, that's a new thing I just invented. Um, that's going to equal 1 over RC. Okay, now what do I do? Right, pick a value for one, solve for the other. Right, you got one equation, two unknowns. So you got to pick one. Which one should we pick? Let's pick the capacitor. Nobody ever has anything lying around other than a one microfarad capacitor. Right, you're pretty sure you're always going to be able to find one of those in a bin somewhere like on the floor or something, I don't know. They're always lying around. Okay, that's how I like to do But you do whatever. There's no wrong answer. I mean, there are wrong answers, but, um, you know, for picking a capacitor value, you can't go wrong. So let's just say I, I chose to pick a microfarad. So according to my math, my resistor ought to equal, let's see if I can do this right on the first try, 1 over capacitor times 40 pi k. Blech. Can I do this in my head and impress you? Probably not. Let's get a calculator. You should have your calculators out too. I make mistakes. Ooh. I'm getting about 8 hertz. Uh, 8, what did I just say, hertz? 8 ohms. Can I get a few more nods of approval or head shakes? Get a thumbs up. What's that? I got uh, 25. 25? 20, You're in the minority. Most people are getting, most people are getting 8. Yeah? Let's see. A micro times a kilo is a milli, so a milli reciprocal is a kilo, so that's 40 times pi, that's 120, 1,000 over 120, this is the same as 1,000 over 125, which is 8. There you go. 7.9. Ah, don't ever put 7.9 on your paper. Do you know why? Good luck finding a resistor with 7.95 ohms on it, okay? Your resistors are all plus or minus 5% anyway, okay? So insisting that you need a 7.95 ohm resistor just makes you look silly, okay? In fact, quite honestly, an 8 ohm resistor is pushing your luck as it is, okay? But anyway, mathematically, that's how to make it work. Sound good? You've just built a filter to spec, all right? That's pretty good. Uh, should we look at it? Should we, I don't know, let's, let's, let's take it out for a ride and see what it does. Anybody ever see a calculator like this? It's called an RPN calculator. <coughs> I used to have one when I was an undergrad. They're awesome. Um, so, for example, for the calculation that we just did, um, like the way you do it is you, you push numbers on the stack and then you apply operations to the stack. So, for example, we had, um, you know, I wanted to do 1 over uh, C times 40 pi times K. So my capacitor was a microfarad. Put it on the stack. There's 40. Put it on the stack. Pi. Put it on the stack. And then K. Put it on the stack. 
So now all my numbers on the, on the stack, all I got to do is push the multiply. So I multiply once, it multiplies the bottom two numbers together, then again, then again, and then I take the reciprocal of the whole mess and I get my answer. It's just a different system of doing numbers. Like instead of doing A plus B, you do B, A, plus. I, mean, if, I don't know. That used to be a way that... It's actually, if you're doing a big... Ooh, hello. If you're doing a big... Uh, Big calculation, it, it makes life um, it makes life a little easier to type things in the calculator. Okay, um, let me duplicate this slide. Uh, copy. Let's rename it. Twenty K. So we said a resistor of eight ohms and a capacitor of a microfarad. Woo! Okay. Well, um, so is my cutoff frequency as predicted? So what, what do we want the cutoff frequency to be? We said 20 kilohertz. And 20 kilohertz is the same as 40, right, it's 40 pi, right, 40 pi, 40 K pi. So that's about, a, oh, geez, so about 120,000. Right, so 120, there's 100,000, there's 200,000, so it's, it's right in the middle. I think I can do a little better than this. First of all, if I want to analyze all the way up to 40k pi, do I really need to waste my time with all these little rinky-dink frequencies? Like, that's in the past band, right? Let's, let's not waste our time analyzing that. So why don't we, um, why don't we start the drama at um, like 1,000 a a thousand radians per second, okay? And I'm going to do one more than that. Um, I would actually want to see this versus hertz, okay? Because at the end of the day, I want to cut off frequency in hertz. I don't want to have to look at this and be like, wait, is that right? 100,000, is that the same as 20 kilohertz? That's not a natural way of thinking, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of, I'm going to do the same plot again, but I'm going to put, um, instead of putting radians per second on the x-axis, I'm going to put hertz on the x-axis. So, first thing we decided is I can pretty much delete everything starting before 1,000. So, why don't I just copy that and paste it up here. Okay. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take my frequency in radians per second and convert it into hertz. So, how am I going to do that? Right. So equals, I'm going to take my number in radians per second and divide it by 2 pi. Name? Oh, yeah. He doesn't know what pi is. You've got to put pi parentheses. Don't ask me. I didn't write Excel. Okay. So paste. Paste it down. Okay. Uh, and let's, um, let's add a few more frequencies. Actually, we don't really need to add a, f a whole lot more frequencies. Um, Yeah, yeah, we're gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna tidy this up in just a second. I'm just gonna add a few more lines here. Okay, now first thing we need to do is go and tell MATLAB that, not MATLAB, we really should do this in MATLAB. In fact, probably on Wednesday we'll do this again in MATLAB. Uh, so the X data, so first of all, the Y values are these ones. Oops. Then we tell it that the X values are these ones. Okay, did it do it? It did do it. And now we just have to tell it that it's okay for it to rescale the x-axis. Uh, format axis, scale, started at uh, 100 hertz, and it can go all the way up to 100. Okay, all right. And I guess we can rescale the y-axis as well. Why don't we just have it do it automatically for us?
Okay, so there's our low. So basically, I've done this exact same thing as we've seen before. The only thing I changed is that instead of insisting on putting radians per second on the x-axis, I just took my radians per second, divided it by 2 pi. Now that's on my y, so that's what's on my x-axis is in hertz. And uh, y-axis is the same, it's still in decibels. The only thing I did was is I just zoomed in a little bit just so you can see the plot better. So, do I have a low-pass filter? Absolutely. Do I have a cutoff frequency of 0.707? Oh, sorry, do I have a cutoff frequency of 20 kilohertz? It's still a little hard to say for sure, right? I mean, here's... Maybe I, let me get rid of some of these decimal points so this column's a little easier to read. Okay, so here's 15 kilohertz. Not a little bit more than 0.707. Here's... 31 kilohertz, 32 kilohertz, and that's below 0.707. So that's pretty good, right? That sort of indicates that we're in the right, in the right neck of the woods. Uh, you know, if I really cared, what I could do is um, I could come over here and say, uh, why don't I just hardwire that at 20K? And this will equal 2 times pi times that number. Again with the pi. We'll use MATLAB next time. It's a lot more civilized. Okay, so if I hardwire in this particular value of 20 kilohertz, it's that many radians per second. That's your 40k pi, and just about 0.707, right? Minus 3 dB. Right on the money, okay? So that's really cool. We've built a low-pass filter exactly to specification. What do you think? Is that okay? Now... This gets into what you're dealing with in lab this week. The cutoff frequency is 20 kilohertz. Does this filter reject perfectly all frequencies after 20 kilohertz? No. In fact, not even close, right? Look at, um, look at this number right here. That's 160 kilohertz. 160 kilohertz. That's eight times your cutoff frequency. At eight times your cutoff frequency, you're still getting 12% of your signal through. So a cutoff frequency is not like a magical thing in that there's this misconception that the way a low-pass filter works is that all signals below the cutoff frequency are perfectly passed. And all frequencies above the cutoff frequency are perfectly rejected. Not true. Okay? Below the cutoff frequency, you know, you're basically passing things. Uh, but above the cutoff frequency, like I said, even at some pretty high frequencies, well above the cutoff frequency, you're still passing bits of signal through. So that sort of begs the question, can you make a better filter? Right? Can you make a filter that does a better job at rejecting high frequencies? And the answer is yes. Okay, and that's part of what you're going to be looking at in lab this week. You can make better filters, right? Filters that work more efficiently at getting rid of multiple signal, uh, getting rid of high frequencies. In fact, maybe we'll do this in our last couple minutes. What if... Um, let me go back to my original plot. So let's just do this conceptually. I'll, I'll work the Excel magic, and, um, and hopefully this will make a nice point. So, knowing what you know now, suppose we build this, let's go back to this filter with a cutoff frequency of whatever it was, 5 radians per second. If I wanted to do a better job at filtering high frequencies, what's the easiest thing I could do? with my existing filter. Don't, adding inductor is complicated. <laughs> How about I just filter it twice? Right? But is that, is that a second order? No, this is a first order. No, I'm saying if you... If ah, if I filter it twice, then it's a second order. Okay. okay. So, what I've got is one of these. That filters my signal, right? Why can't I filter it again? Right? Can I do that? Can I build this circuit? Totally. This is a legit move. 
You can do this. All right. So let's think about what happens. Let's say we're at, um, so let's say for the sake of argument we're at, uh, oh, let's pick a number, 20, 20 radians per second. So I put in a cosine at 20 radians per second. What's that cosine going to look like at the output of the first filter? Half. Not half. half Read it right off the thing, 0.24. OK, so if you put in 20t, over here, you're going to get 0.24 cosine 20t, plus some phase. But let's not worry about the phase right now. So that's pretty good, right? You got rid of most of your signal. But if I filter it again, now what's going to be the output of my circuit? Same. No, with the same filter? I mean, with the same yeah, yeah. component values? Yeah, same component values. 24% of 24%, right? This circuit is going to take whatever the input is and times it by 0.24. So my output now will be 0.24 times 0.24 cosine 20t. Well, let's see, 0.24 times 0.24, that's like 0.062 something or other, right? Am I close? 257? Really? Man, OK. That was pretty close. OK. Um, OK, so that's pretty good, right? One filter got me down to 0.24. Two filters got me to 0.05. Yes? 20t. 20t. Yeah, it was sloppy. OK. So let's build that, OK? So all I'm going to do, OK, and again, I'm, I'm going to spare you the, uh, the nitty gritty of how I kind of build this. All I'm going to do is I'm basically going to take my signal. So all I, did to, all I did to get my new output for each frequency is I'm basically just going to square this number, right? Because it's basically, you're going to multiply, you're going to send it through the signal twice. You're going to square it. So. So here's my K for filtering it twice, and that is an awful lot of decimal points, which I don't, oh, hello. And then once again, I'm going to have to take the dBs of that, because that's how civilized people make plots. And we're going to put in, uh, just again, OK, so now I'm ready to add a new, uh, a new uh, line. Let's see, select data. I'm going to add, um, so the name is filter2. The y values are equal to those. And the x values are equal to Okay, so which is better? So the blue one is the original filter. The red one is what I get if I stack two low-pass filters in a row. All right, so I do a double job of filtering my signal. So at <coughs> 100 radians per second, which filter is doing a better job of rejecting the signal? Totally the red one. It's not even close. Look at this. At 100 radians per second, the blue signal is giving you maybe like 25, 30 dB of rejection. The red one is giving you about 60. Double. OK, 60 dB is a factor. It's dividing it by 1,000. OK, so my point, all I'm trying to communicate is this. Not that I want you to become some like filtering ninjas. I'm just trying to, well, I do, but we'll get there. Um, but my point is that not all filters are built the same, that for whatever your cutoff frequency is, there's always going to be signal that gets passed above the cutoff frequency. And 
And the last take home message is that it's possible to design new filters that are more efficient at removing the bits of the signal you don't want. Okay, there's, there's, there's possible to build a better, there's always other ways of building the filter other than like a simple RC circuit. The RC circuit is nice because it's easy and we can sort of touch all the pieces of it and it makes sense. But you can certainly make more sophisticated filters that do a better job of rejecting the cosines that you don't want and keeping the ones that you do. That was pretty good for one hour, all right? I'll see you on Wednesday.